Good morning, Crossroads. We're so glad you guys are here. Would you go ahead and stand and worship with us?
sure you guys can relate to this. I do this thing where whenever I sin or whenever I mess up, my first instinct is to feel shame and condemnation, which causes me to run and hide away from God. And of course, the enemy likes to assist with amplifying those feelings. But this next song talks about not running away, but running to the Father, bringing our hearts and our souls to the only one who knows how to fix and heal whatever is going on. This past Tuesday, while we were practicing this song, um, I felt like God laid this scripture on my heart. It's Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, for, and it says, we, for we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So what that scripture is saying is that God understands and he empathizes with anything that we go through, that he wants us to approach him and come to him with freedom, with confidence, with comfortability. I can't say that word right, sorry. But he wants us to be comfortable coming to him with all of our problems, with anything and everything. So as we worship with this uh, last song, I just want you, I want to encourage you to picture running to God, picture going to God, almost running to his arms with confidence, with freedom, not afraid, not, no shame, no condemnation, because that comes from the enemy and he wants to keep you there. But God doesn't want you to be there. He wants you to approach him, come to him with freedom, with confidence that only comes from his love for us. So let's continue to worship.
pray. Dear God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that thank you that we we can come to you with confidence. We can come to you with freedom and not fear, not shame, not condemnation. God, I ask that you please help us to remember that when we're in trouble, when we mess up, when we sin, that we can not go to shame and condemnation, but that we can go to confidence and freedom in your love for us, that we know that we can approach you, that you will deliver us and you will help us through whatever's going on. Right now, I ask that you please open up our hearts, open up our minds to receive the word that's going to come forth, that we receive it. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and greet each other. Well, good morning. Hey, amid service, a um, few words here. If you are here for the first time, we want to welcome you specifically. If, if you're newer around here, I welcome to you as well. If you've been around here a long time, welcome to you. It's one of our goals is to help everybody in their next steps here around Crossroads. And if we can help you in any way, we'd love to. If as you leave, there's a welcome center in the lobby. If you want to drop by there, there's friendly folks. They can answer a lot of questions, not math questions, but a lot of other questions. And if you're in the auditorium and the chair is in front of you, there is a QR code. You can scan that or the lower part of your screen. That will lead you to the Crossroads app, which is free, but it gives a lot of information of what's going on around here, and there's a lot of information for the fall coming up, but welcome. Hey, if you're a woman, there is a woman's movie night out back on the lawn on Friday, September 27th. It's at 6.30. Uh, you can find information at crossroadsgrace.org women but we didn't invite you. There is room, invite a friend, and it's free, and so we're hoping to see you there. And then for everybody here at Crossroads, groups. This week starts groups. It's not too late to join a group. We think it's normal to be in a group if you're at Crossroads and call it your home. If you go to crossroadsgrace.org slash groups, you'll see that you can look at days of the week, times of the week, and we encourage you to find a group that fits for you. I know there's room in my group. It's a guys-only group on Wednesday night. We're going through the series on Romans, but um, find a group. You'll also find some specialty groups like Grief Share. I've been part of Grief Share, leading Grief Share groups for a few years now, and they're wonderful experiences. We offer those online and in person, but if you go through a 13-week group, partway in, just a few weeks in, people regularly say, I'm amazed that you were all total strangers a few weeks ago, but I feel like you were helping me grow through my grief, my loss. I'm not a unicorn, I'm not a cyclops, there are other people just like me, and Grief Share has been a way for people to say, okay, you're helping me in my loss. Grief Share is an amazing group, other groups are amazing groups, but jump into a group, Crossroads Grace, throw slash groups. And then your financial giving is helping make, it, uh, helping make ministry happen, Thank you, thank you for that. Care groups and marriage ministry groups. And um, Jay Clark counsels here at Crossroads, and he counsels one day a week and three evenings a week. And he's um, led 383 sessions since January 1st. There's a lot of ministry going on. Your giving is helping make that happen. If you have questions about how we spend money, if you go to crossroadsgrace.org giving, there is um, information for you. But I'm really, really excited that you're here on a warm afternoon, the last 100-degree day of September. And uh, we were hoping that you enjoy the series in Romans, looking at the Holy Spirit, and today, unashamed. Well, good morning, everybody. 11.30, good morning. And uh, yeah, today, everybody's zero-zero right now, even my Bengals, so we're getting excited about the season. So 
Hey, glad you're here today. My name is Pastor Brian. I'm the lead pastor here. And I just, I just love, love Sundays, love getting to see you guys, whether you're uh, online or in person. And always want to remind you that our mission is that we exist to lead everyone to discover Jesus and follow him fully. We, we just believe that following Jesus is the greatest thing you could do with your life. And we want everybody to know that. And so we would love for you to have at least one person in your life that you're praying for, you're connecting with. We call them our ones, so that someday they could discover Jesus, follow Jesus, and then be led to be able to lead somebody else. So uh, that's why we're here. That's why we exist. Welcome to you online, wherever you might be joining us, around the country, around the world. We've got Chris as your online chat host. So thank you so much. If you would like to join Chris and be a part of that team, easy enough to be able to just reach out to them or anybody here that would love to be part of that team. We'd uh, love to grow that team to have a little bit, a few more chat hosts available. So if you would, you can let us know. But uh, guys, before I dive into the message, so many good things to celebrate here that are happening at our church, the things that, that God is just moving in the life of families and individuals individuals here. Uh, we have some great big unstoppable goals for the next two years and we've been trying to be very intentional about letting you know how the how things are happening, keeping you in the loop on the, with things and that means that it's time for our next unstoppable quarterly update to come. It's literally hot off the presses that we've got for you. We'll be emailing that to you and you'll also get a lovely snail mail version of this that'll be coming to you. So uh, we'd love for you to kind of take a look at that. Uh, lots of things have been happening this summer. We're just kind of looking at between June June and now, uh, and this summer, we've been doing all kinds of stuff. There's been uh, events on the back lawn that we've been able to do, next-gen parties, barbecues, camps, all things happening. And guys, if you didn't know, we've had over 600 new guests just between June and right now. But more importantly, we have had 103 people take the next step to follow Jesus and get baptized. 103 people. That's just really, really great. And there is so much to kind of talk about and check out. You can do all of that by looking at your Unstoppable update, again, in your email or in the mail. But here, here's the thing. Unstoppable is a journey that is just beginning, really. Our desire is to reach more people in the Central Valley for Jesus. And I'm proud to be part of a church and to lead a church that's willing to, to reach everyone that we possibly can, to be able to unleash our future by being unburdened by all kinds of different things in our life so we can do the most ministry possible, and then to navigate life together, even when life is really, really messy. So uh, if you want more information, you can check out the Unstoppable link that's right next to me or in the lobby. We'd love to talk with you about that. But as you look at these updates that are going to be coming to you, would you do this for me? Would you thank God for what he's doing here? And would you also pray for our church? Just, just pray that God would continue to bless and do immeasurably more than we can think or imagine as we just believe that we, our God is unstoppable and we want to be a church that's unstoppable with him. Um, also, guys, I'm pumped to be back with you. I was gone last week and it was just, I was just so grateful for Pastor Ed uh, last weekend. He did such a great job and I love, I value his wisdom, honestly, his friendship, his care for our staff in our church. It's, it's amazing. You may never know how hard that man actually works each and every day to help us all become better. And he puts up with me, so God bless him. That is amazing in and of itself. But thank you to Pastor Ed. So grateful. If you missed that message last week, go back and listen to it. It's a great message. Uh, but I want to welcome you back to this unashamed series that we're in the middle of. It's a look at the book of Romans. Now, we're in season two of that study. Now, we're breaking into different seasons. In fact, we have a new season guide, season two. So if you had season one, that's great. But season two, we have a brand new one. So if you didn't get that on the way in, just put your hand up and our team will come and bring one to you free of charge, no big deal. You can take notes. You can have, there's uh, questions that are in there just to help you take a next step with Jesus. So keep them up. Our team's kind of coming forward there, which will be great. That You can take some notes in a second. But the reason that we're breaking this up into different seasons is that there are different sections to the text of Romans that we want to come alive a little bit more as we go through it. it just, just like a good meal has different courses and th things like that. Each portion of Romans, we want to kind of come alive in its own so we can enjoy it as we go. Which is why in season one, Paul really focused on the gospel. Really, the gospel message that God sent Jesus from heaven to earth as a, as a, as a, a, run a rescue mission for you and me for our sins. And, and if we will believe in him, we'll have eternal life. If we don't, then we're in the path of the wrath of God, as the scripture tells us. But Jesus brings us a new life, and it's only found in him. But really, that's season one. But the question that we have would naturally come up is after we have heard about the gospel and understand the gospel, so what's next? That's, that's usually what you're curious about once it's made known in your life. And the truth is that in order to, to answer that question of what is next, we got to learn to walk differently. 
It's, it's kind of like when, when you were a to, you're like a toddler all over again. You're trying out your legs for the first time. Parents, do you, like, do you remember that? You, you know, like, it, it's, it's that moment that, that we've all been hoping for, that, that your child would one day do the minute they were born, the, the, the moment that they, they would walk, and you could check that off of the things to stress out about and freak out about as a parent, the one little box, the million that are there. And, and, and yet the second, the second that they start to walk, what do you do? You regret that you ever prayed that they could walk. Am I right? Like, it, it just, the whole thing just gets jacked. But, but, but I, and, I, and you remember, like they were scooting on the coffee table like they're the outside of a ledge of a building for like a second, you know? And then you're on the other end and you've got those yogurt melt puffs. Right? Remember those things? And with enough of them, they would let go and then they're just like a baby giraffe just trying to like figure out how to walk, you know? And their legs are filled with jello. And then all of a sudden, like it's like their, their legs like figured out the muscles Start to, the synapses from the brain make it to the muscles and, and oh my goodness, from the floor is crumbling underneath me to like, boom, like dead sprint. They're ready to go. That, that was my son Easton. I'm telling you, man, when he began to walk, it got crazy, y'all. It just got crazy. And, and we did, which I'm guessing a lot of you probably did this too, but we created a, like a UFC octagon in our living room. Do you remember that? Like you put chairs down and ottomans down and, you know, other things and laser wire and barbed wire and all the things just to keep, for our set. Now in our place, we had a townhouse in, in Chicago. And there's like 20 steps straight down, like a death step all the way down. So we are just trying to keep Easton away from that. But despite all of our efforts, Easton's Easton. And one day he just broke out somehow, like Garmy crawled underneath everything. He hops on his Winnie the Pooh fire engine toy, goes straight down the stairs all the way down. And uh, great parenting move, I know, explains a lot. But it's okay. Like, that's all right. That's my boy. I love him. But it's all because he learned to walk. That's what happened. Hey, the same is true about living this new life with the Spirit of God in our life. But instead of your mom and dad on one side holding their arms out, you've got the God of the universe over there saying, hey, you could do it, you could do it. But, but he says, you're not alone. I'm, I'm actually going to give you some help as, as you walk in this, this new life. Because as, as we learn to walk in this new way, God actually gives us a walking assistant to come along with us. He's called the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about him in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, there he would say, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Now here's what I know. When I start talking about the Spirit of God, some things start to happen. We start to get uh, a little bit freaked out. We start to kind of get a little, 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 little squirrely on this. And, and, and one of it is, is, that, is, is that ultimately what he's, he's saying here is that when we get concerned too much about, uh, about the world, we lose sight of the Spirit. But when we start to follow the Spirit, we're truly starting to live. And, and that we, we say no to what the world says and we start to say yes to what God says because living in the Spirit frees us from the weight of that sin. Frees us from the weight of death in this world and it keeps us, that's keeping us down because of our sin. And it actually allows us to live and to breathe for the first time because now we're connected to the Spirit of God. But Paul would tell us in Romans chapter 8, we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit more in a couple of weeks. But he says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit that you live in and live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. But as I was saying, too often when we talk about the spirit, though, we get all kind of just weirded out a little bit. We start getting freaked out and, and everything. We start thinking that the spirit of God's like ghosts and, and spooky stuff. And we start thinking about speaking in weird languages and tongues and holding snakes and hanging out with chickens and all kind of, you know, dancing around like Elaine from Seinfeld or, or running like Phoebe from Friends. You remember that? Like just everything's all weird. But then on the other hand, Here's the other thing sometimes we'll do. We'll sometimes think of the Spirit of God as the weaker part of the Trinity. We think, you know, God in heaven, man, he's super strong. He's got power from heaven. Jesus, he was awesome. He had a lot of power when he was here. But the Spirit, mm, he's just kind of there. He's like a golden retriever. He's really nice to pet and licks you in the face a little bit, but he really doesn't have a lot of power. I'm not really fearful of him at all. 
But the Spirit is not an add-on to the Godhead. He is just as powerful, just as mighty, just as majestic as God the Father and God the Son. Because he was there at the creation of the entire world, too. Genesis chapter 1, we get to read about it. It says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And who? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This and about a hundred other references in the Old Testament speak of the Spirit of God as an active agent in the lives of both men and women, as you see throughout Scripture. Then we get to the New Testament. And then Jesus himself says that the Spirit is so powerful, it's so amazing, that, hey, disciples, you should want me to leave so that the Spirit of God can come. Jesus says this in John 16. But very truly, I, Jesus, tells you, that's disciples and also us, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So the Spirit of God is so crucial to the life of a believer that Jesus says, listen, you can't overlook his presence in your life. And at the very same time, we should never be ashamed of him either. That, that we live our lives unashamed of the Spirit of God who is directing and guiding our lives in every possible way. And so this season, this, this new season of, of, of Romans, what we're going to do is that Paul is going to implore us to live a life that's unashamed of the Spirit of God in our life. Over these next few weeks, we're going to continue to, to journey through Romans, but we're going to see what does it look like to be led by the Spirit of God. So if you have your, your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to open to, with me to Romans chapter 6 today or your Crossroads Grace apps. You can find that in your, in your guides too. You can take some notes with me if you'd like to. And, uh, and uh, Chris, if you don't mind, you can go ahead and put that link in there for the, the people, the folks at home. So again, welcome to you guys at home. Hope you're with, doing well. Uh, but, but there are, um, as you do that, as you think, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of words that when you, you hear them, it instantly creates an emotion in you depending on the context in which they're used. Now, we, we use this kind of this more popular phrase, triggered, this word triggered. It means that you're, you're speaking to the same thing, that it, it sparks something in you when you hear those words. So, so, for example, if we were in a movie theater together and someone yells fire, we would all get very scared. We look for the exits to be able to get out of there as fast as we can. If, if you're playing golf right, and, and somebody, somebody shouts, four, like you just, you duck for cover. You hope that golf ball doesn't doink you in the dome and you get hurt. Like you, you, it brings something up in you. If you're in a plane and, and the pilot comes over and says, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be experiencing some major turbulence in a few minutes. What do you do? Well, you use the bathroom, number one, right? And then after that, you, get, you sit down because it's going to be a ride for a little bit. But immediately you think of something. You have a reaction when you think of those words within the context in which you're at. Here's the deal. I would argue that, that the word that I'm about to say would have the same thing, if not even more. And, and when I say this word, I think it's going to draw something inside you. It's the word slave. The, the word slave brings about powerful painful thoughts and emotions to us. And, and as, we, as we take a moment to, to discuss some of these events in our history, it's very important for us to, to start there, to gain an understanding of it culturally, but then also to understand the context in which the word is used in Scripture. Slavery has been a very hurtful practice, and it's affected all races of people, believe it or not, all the way back from 6800 B.C. in the Mesopotamians. Yet for us in the United States, slavery carries a, a, it's a blight on our country that's still being talked about today. It wasn't until the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 through the 13th Amendment to our Constitution that slavery was abolished. Now I say the United States because other countries and other nations weren't so lucky as to have it happen then. But not every Confederate territory would immediately be free. Because even though the Emancipation Proclamation took effect in 1863, it took until June 19th, 1865, for it to reach the westernmost Confederate state of Texas. And on that day, the army entered into Texas and announced that more, hundred, more than 250,000 enslaved black people in that state were now free. And that date became known as Juneteenth, which is now what we celebrate as a nation, as a holiday today. But slavery 
has been thrust back into the societal scene the past five to ten years with a vengeance. With, with the rise of social injustice and racial equality and reparations and DEI and, and so many other hot-button race-based issues, it has become front-page issues for, for nearly all of the political landscape. We see it everywhere. So, so there is no doubt that the word slavery is a trigger and it brings up a visceral response to people. I mean, the idea of being forced against your will to serve another person seems barbaric. And the horror stories of slavery is nothing short of heartbreaking. It makes you just shake your head in disbelief. So, so mentioning the word slave causes a reaction emotions, negative connotations just by hearing it. And we're going to talk more about this in the 99 podcast this week, so make sure you tune into that. But, but it is worth recognizing that, that slavery is mentioned in the Bible. You, you might even say that, that it's in there often. But it is important to know that there was varying ways of slavery being applied, with the most, the most obvious distinction being that not all the applications of slavery were being forced upon people. There were instances that, that, that we learn and we read about in Scripture where people chose slavery. So, so what I mean is that there is no black person ever that would choose to be held against their will in the barbaric manner that slaves were, and because that's how we envision it in our understanding of slavery, that would be known as involuntary servitude. But in Paul's time, he, there are some that voluntarily chose servitude, and in some cases would do so to pay the debt for their family. And it is this voluntary servitude that I need you to hold on to today with me. But what is true What is across the board true about everything is that slavery means that you are under the authority, you are under the control of something else, which which is what Paul says to us as he starts in Romans. In Romans 16, he says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Paul's saying that whoever is your master, that is who you are obedient to. And as we think about that, we are incensed. No one should ever control me. Like, no one's going to control me like that. And it's so hard for us to do because we can't help but think of our modern idea of involuntary slavery. It, 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 we can't do anything but put that into Paul's words. But what he's doing, he's, he's describing voluntary slavery in which we are choosing this type of servitude. That's what Paul's talking about. Which is why we, before we get too upset here, we need to allow Paul to finish his thought. Because what, when we do that, what we're going to realize is that it changes everything. And it sets the stage for everything that we'll talk about today. The rest of verse 16, let's read it in context. He says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, now, here's what I want us to do. And I want us to really think about this, okay? And, and I, need you, I just need you, to, I need you to dig deep for a second. Really dig deep. And I don't want you to be very quick to justify. I don't want you to make excuses by, by default. Don't do that. I want you to do but, but remember, okay, a second ago we said that certain words spark intense feelings inside us, don't they? Here's what I wonder. I wonder if we have the same visceral, passionate, angry, I can't believe that they would do that when we hear the word sin as we do slaves. Do do we ever lose our breath when we think about the destruction that sin has caused in our life? Do we ever stop and think of the amount of control that sin has had over us or that is in control of us right now, the freedom that that word has taken from us? Would we ever storm the streets in protest over sin like we do other injustices? And yet here's the crazy part. Do you realize that instead of being held against our will like involuntary servitude slaves were, We are willingly being held as slaves to our sin. That we 
choose it. When it comes to sin in our life, we are not being held against our will. Instead, we want it in our life and we choose it over what God wants. Now, now let, let, let me make sure here. Let me make sure that we're all on the same page. I want, to shake, I want to make sure that we got the same definition. I'm going to bring us back to week two. When we talk about sin, this is what I'm talking about. Sin is anything we do, say, or think that is counter to the holiness of God. That's what sin is. That's what we're talking about. And so what we do is that we choose to become slaves to sin in our life. And by choosing that, we are choosing things that are not of God, and we are placing ourselves in shackles. And Paul knew that this image would be very, very important to those readers in Rome. Because he knew that they knew how harsh it was to be a slave in Rome. The, the historian Diodorus, he wrote about this, the life of a slave in the first century. Let me, let me read this to you. He says that the slaves who are engaged in the working of the mines produce for their masters revenues in sums defying belief. But they themselves wear out their bodies both by day and by night in the diggings under the earth, dying in large numbers because of the exceptional hardships they endure for no respite or pause is granted them in their labors, but compelled beneath blows of the overseers to endure the severity of their plight, they throw away their lives in this wretched manner. Indeed, death in their eyes is more to be desired than life because of the magnitude of the hardships they must bear. So when Paul is writing to the Romans, that is most likely what they're envisioning. And again, remember that those people that we're talking about there, though, that they were held against their will by the Romans. And in the Roman Empire at that time, did you know that 20% of the entire population of the Roman Empire would have been involuntary servitude slaves at the time? And so to these people, to think of that same idea being attributed to their faith, to their connection to sin, it would have been crippling to them. Which is why in verse 19, he goes on to say, in verse 19, he says, I'm using an example from everyday life. That's why we was using it. Because of your human limitations, just as you used to offer yourself as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. He says, by offering yourselves up to be consumed by sin, you are choosing to be slaves to it. Sin has become your master. And guys, this is not something that we're helpless to. Like, we can't just say, well, darn it, I guess I brushed up against some sin today, like it's poison ivy or something like that. It, 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 we aren't passive participants in sin. When we wake up and we think, well, I guess I drew this, the short stick and I guess I'm a sinner. Ah, oh, bummer. No. It happens when you and I allow ourselves to give in to this, this little word with a big, big meaning called temptation. And temptation is totally different than sin. Temptation is a fork in the road. It's where we can choose the things of God or not. And Jesus' brother James, he gives us the most vivid example of this in James chapter 1. Uh, there he would say, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So, so here is how temptation works. And I need this to be very clear about this. James just said, he wants to be very clear. He says, listen, God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt. So he wouldn't do that. That's sinful. That is evil. God is not evil. Who is, though, is Satan. And Satan has been tempting since the very beginning of time, all the way back in the garden. Remember the tree that they weren't supposed to touch? And Satan says, oh, God's not going to kill you if you eat from it. And so Eve ate from it, gave to her husband Adam He's tempting. And so Satan tempts us with two options. He's saying, hey, you can trust God if you want, but reality, you should run after him because this sin is so alluring to you. And, and so James would say, here's the formula. He says, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tempt you, and then here's, the, here's my, the, 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 the sprinkles on top of the temptation. I'm going to give you the desire for it, and I'm going to entice you with it. I'm going to make you desireful of it. I want to entice you with it. And once you bite on the apple, you then have been given into sin. 
And he says, when it's full grown, don't you love those words? When sin is full grown, it leads us to, to death, which all starts by you and I choosing to give into temptation and to move away from the things that we know are good and are right. Which is why Paul would say this in verses 20 and 21. He says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit do you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death, he says. Paul is saying this. He's saying that when we choose to be a slave to sin, you are no longer held captive. Do you see it? By the control of righteousness. He says you're no longer in control of righteousness. And yet we might think, oh man, that's freedom. Finally. You know what Paul says? It's a lie. Because when you are out of the control of righteousness, you are going to result in death. That's what it brings. Which is why, I just think this is so interesting. When I was preparing for this message, something just jumped out at me. It was this juxtaposition that I found in, in, in Romans chapter 6. Because if we take a second, we look at our, our series verse, which is Romans 1.16, that says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. He says, it's, we're not ashamed of the gospel. Then we consider it against Romans 6, which says, what benefit did you reap at the time from the things you are now ashamed of. Those things result in death. He's saying, he's saying that we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel, but there is something you should be ashamed of. He says, you and I should be ashamed of anything in our life that is sinful. We should be ashamed of our sin. But you know what? In our day and age, we are not ashamed of our sin at all. We, we flaunt it, as a badge of honor, people shoplifting in the middle of broad daylight in San Francisco, wiping out businesses left and right. 49ers player just this week that got shot because somebody was trying to steal their Rolex in front of their kids. We flaunt it. Did you remember when we used to be embarrassed if we would sleep with someone before we got married? And, and now, you know what we do? We call, oh, we just celebrate it. We say it's, called, it's part of our body count. You, you, you remember, you remember when, when, it was rude to, when it was rude and people were embarrassed, we were rude to other people? It was repulsive. Now we video it. We put it on YouTube because we call everybody Karens and we're getting more likes and all this stuff. We are leveraging our sin for more sin. That, that's what we're doing. But listen to me. We should not see our sin as a badge of honor. It should be a stain of shame on our life. Sin destroys you and me from the inside out because it separates us from a holy God. B because as, as we continue to choose the slavery of sin over the freedom of Christ, we're moving farther and farther away from God and what he wants for us and closer and closer to the death that Satan wants for us. Which is why Paul is very clear to say, for the wages of sin is death. Now, now, we might brush by that because we might have heard it a thousand times, but the Greek word is obscenion. And obscenion is a very interesting word. The only time it's ever used in Scripture is this right here. Obscenion means compensation. So Paul is very purposeful on what words he uses, and he uses the word obscenion to describe. He says, he says listen, listen, at some point, your sin will be paid for. There will be compensation. There will, obscenion will happen. And that, that will either be paid for by you for all eternity apart from God, or you can allow Jesus who already paid for your eternity and you can receive his grace. This is because Jesus has already chose, right, to make a way for us by the cross. But ultimately the choice to receive that grace is up to you and me. Whether we choose freedom or we choose the shackles of sin. If you get nothing else out of the day, I want you to know that we are all slaves to something, but we can choose what it'll be. Will, will, will we choose Jesus or, or will we choose our food addiction? Will, will we choose Jesus or will we fall into to, to being prideful and bitter because our coach doesn't do this and we're mad about this? Will, will, we, will we choose Jesus or will we fall into soul-crushing gossip about someone else? Will, will we choose Jesus or that cute girl at work that's not my wife? 
Will, will we choose Jesus or will we choose laziness and, and apathy in our life? Guys, I, I struggle with this, honestly. I'm not immune to this junk in my life. And here's where Satan gets me. It's when he plays to my insecurity about being a failure. So, so when this happens, I have this choice. I can, I can follow Jesus, yes, or I can fall into that trip, that, that trap that my identity is in, is in, is it what I do or how well I do it? And if I go for that, I go into this rabbit hole of fear and self-doubt, and I start thinking that if I screw up, I'm just not going to ever be enough. I, I fear disappointing God, my, my wife, my kids, my family, every single person here, this church that I love so much. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll try really hard to do everything I can so I don't mess up, because that's exactly what Satan wants me to do. He wants me to believe that it's all about me and that I'm the center of my success or my failure. And Paul would actually say that all sin actually jumps at the chance for us to choose it over God. Twice in Romans 7, he uses this phrase. He says, for sin, seizing the opportunity. I love that. Because sin is so hungry for you, my friends. It wants to destroy you. And that's why Peter's vision, this version of this description of Satan in 1 Peter 5 is unbelievably accurate. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. <laughs> Do you know the way Satan does this? He's so sneaky. He's so messed up. It is a spiritual bait and switch that he does all the time. Satan, Satan will say, hey, hey, listen. Just send that seductive picture of yourself to that guy at work. Your husband's never going to know. Click. Satan says, well, what, what, what did you do? How, how could you do that? Your husband, is, he's totally going to find out. There's no way he won't. What kind of mother are you? You're, you're never going to get forgiven for that. Satan says, hey, hey, you deserve that truck. You, you work really, really hard. Just get it. No, no matter what, you'll figure out the payment somehow. No problem. Okay, I'll, I'll take it immediately after. What, what have you done, Satan says? You can't afford that. You, you're upside down under a mountain of debt. You, 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 now your kids won't be able to play sports. You can't afford that anymore. Why didn't you just wait until you had the money to pay for it? Hey, hey, Satan will say, hey, hey, listen. You, your friends, they're going to that game after the party. They're going to the, the, the party after the game. It, the, the parents don't care. You can drink, you can vape, you can do whatever you want. And, and just, just go, because you want to be part of the in crowd, don't you? I, I definitely do. Okay, I'm, I'm coming. Satan says, well, look what you've done now. You better kiss that scholarship goodbye. Your reputation as a Christian, oh, that's gone. What are your friends going to think about you now, Christian? Can you see it? It's this, it's this bait, and it's a switch, just so you can get caught up in the line of sin and you are a slave to it and you wonder what in the world am I going to do now and if you listen to Satan he's going to make you feel hopeless he'll make you believe that there's no chance of redemption because redemption dies when our sin overtakes our, takes our lives <laughs> but do you know what Satan's a liar <laughs> because, because Jesus made a way for us to have life again. Even though, y'all, we don't deserve it and we should pay the full penalty for our sin, he gives us a way around it, in fact, through it by his grace. But you and me, we got to choose it. we got to choose him over the wages of sin that is death. Which is why Paul is so adamant to these readers in Rome and then also to us when he says in verse 17 and 18, what he says is so important because he says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. God is making a way for us to be free in our sin by Jesus. And you want to know the most absolutely amazing part? The key to your freedom has been right in front of you the entire time. 
It is in the person and work of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that you can be made free. And it's right here for everybody to get, right here. But <laughs> I'm going to cramp your brain up here. Because here's the deal. We think this is freedom. We got nothing holding us back. We're like my French bulldog when we release him into the open. It's just like, ah, you know. We got jowls going everywhere. We're like nothing holding me back, uh, 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 doing whatever I want to do. Nothing can get in my way. That's what we think is freedom, isn't it? That's what we think. Do you know that isn't actually freedom? This is chaos. Because you and me, we were wired by the creator of the universe to be guided and directed. And without it, all will happen. We will be a prisoner to our chaotic choices. But since we have the ability to choose, we can choose to be slaves to something else, or dare I say someone else, to God. You and I can willingly say we want to be connected to him in every way possible so he can direct our lives, that we will have his mercy on our lives in the most beautiful of ways. That in God, we find freedom by being a slave to his righteousness. Remember, remember, we are all slaves to something, but we can choose what it will be. God allows us to choose. Will we choose to be a slave to our sin, or will we simply say, you know what? I think I want to be connected, and I want to be locked in. I want to be a slave to Jesus. I want to be connected to him in any way I possibly can. This is the contrast that Paul is trying to make in the book of Romans. He's saying, you don't have to be a slave to sin. You don't have to be a slave to the law of God that is impossible to reach, that only through Jesus you can reach it. He says, instead, you can be a slave to God and his righteousness because he loves us that much. And, and he would tell us this in verse 22, so good. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. He would say in chapter 7, verse 6, but now by dying to once, once, to what once bound us, we have been raised, been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And Paul would go again in Galatians chapter 4, he would say, uh, in 5, he would say, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The King James would say the bondage of slavery. And yet you know what's probably happening in some of our hearts? We're probably thinking like, well, why in the world would I want to do that? Why would I want to shackle myself to that? Sure seems like God's just trying to keep me from a bunch of stuff. He doesn't want me to live or have any fun. I'm not sure I want any of that. But do you want to know what this does? It tethers us to something that is good and righteous. And when we're tethered to Jesus, we have an anchor to come back to. Well, we, have a, we have a guardrail that says it, that tells us that we could go this far, but no further, because that's going to lead us to death. But if you stay here, you can have life. And we have a Savior that loves us enough. Listen to me very carefully. We have a Savior that loves us enough to tell us no. And he, has, he loves us enough to show us where we can find life. My friends, I just would submit to you that this is not a heavy burden. This is an honor to be connected to the creator of the universe and to know that his love is there for us, that he would love us so much that he would die on this cross for you and for me. He would give up his one and only son for you and for me. And so I would gladly, gladly be tethered to this until he came back. My friends, it is very simple. We are all slaves to something, but we can choose. You can choose. I can choose what it'll be. And, and, and I'll tell you this just right now. If you want to see the most vivid example of someone that says, I no longer want to be a slave to the world, I want to be tethered to Jesus, y'all get baptized. 
get baptized, accept Jesus and publicly declare that you believe that he is your Lord and Savior. September 19th and 22nd weekend, we are going to get a bunch of people's heads wet. We're going to dunk like crazy and we're going to see people decide that they want to be slaves to righteousness. And so if you have not done that, this is the time. We want you to be a part of it and do it. Our team would love to talk with you more about it, about what that looks like. I would just tell you this, that the only way that that can start is when you accept Christ for the first time. That before you can do anything, you need to express with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is. But I will tell you again, it's up to us. The first step is to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior to let go of the slavery of sin and to receive the gift of life that he offers us. The wages of sin is death, but by following Jesus, you are more alive than you've ever been. So this walk this week that you're gonna take, I want you to reread Romans 6, 15 through 7, 23 on your own. And I want you to ask these questions of yourself. What sin have you chosen to be a slave to in your life right now? What is it? And number three, what is keeping you from the freedom that's found in Christ? And I'll just give you a cheat answer on that. Nothing. Nothing should hold you back. So before we we sing in a second to prepare our hearts, I just want to give us an opportunity to, to respond to that. That if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have been shackled by sin your entire life, I just want to offer to you and present to you a chance to change that that you can choose a different master today. That you no longer have to be a slave to fear and to shame, but you can be shackled to righteousness and love and mercy and grace and forgiveness found in Jesus, in Jesus alone. Because we all will be a slave to something. We get to choose what it'll be. Heavenly Father God, I pray for this holy moment right now that those that are within the sound of my voice, whether they're online or in person, God, that you, you just speak to us through your Holy Spirit. And then if there's anyone within the sound of my voice right now that is, is coming to the realization that they are slaves to their sin, that they have chosen to go away from you instead of towards you, that they have decided that they are a better God than you and that their lives are hopeless and empty God, I pray that as they realize that today, that they would realize that they don't have to live in hopelessness anymore. That the key to their freedom is on the cross of Christ. And that you, Jesus, you, Jesus, are our hope. And I pray, Father, that as we wrestle with this moment, that we would finally just give in. And that if there's anyone here that has not accepted Christ, they would simply say, God, I'm a sinner. and I'm apart from you because of it. I'm shackled to my sin. I am a slave to sin and I feel hopeless and empty and lost I realize I am destined for death but today I realize that I don't have to be I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior who paid for my sins on the cross that he makes me free of sin and now I can live new and I want to follow him the rest of my days I want to be attached, tethered to him all the rest of my days And I will repent of my sins. I'll embrace my future and I will walk with you. God, you tell us that if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, that we are are free. We are new creations in you. And I pray many would do that. And I pray that as we remember and we worship you now through this song, that if there are some that have fallen far, fall from that, or those that follow Jesus and have just wandered away, that they would wander back to you and get back with you and reattach themselves to you. And in this moment, we would worship you well because we are free in you. God, you tell us if anyone claims you as Savior, as Jesus as Savior, that, that, the, that the heavens rejoice. So might our worship now just be an extension of our worship and rejoicing of you as more and more people become followers of Christ, choosing you as the one that wants to, that you as our master. We love you, Jesus. We praise you in your name we pray. Stand to your feet. Let's worship Jesus together. Prepare our hearts for communion.
Come over here. What's up, buddy? What's up, buddy? You want to hear the best worshiper in this entire place right here? Hey, you're awesome. Thanks for leading us in worship, okay? We're going to take communion here, okay? Do you have your communion with you? We've got to bring up your stuff next time, right? No. Okay. This is the bread. That was Jesus' body, represents Jesus' body. That was broken for you, for me, and my friend. Let's take and eat in remembrance of him. juice. It represents the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's take and drink in remembrance of him. Let's pray. God, we love you, and I thank you for your grace that is so real and so good. Would you remind us that we are no longer slaves to anything that holds us back, that we can choose. We can choose you, and we do that every day of our life. Guide us direct us. Let us follow you in your love as we go into a dark world and be light to it. We love you and we thank you. And God's, all God's people said, amen. amen. What do we tell them? God bless you and God, God bless you and, and, and guide you guys all. Yeah. Tag you're it.